All right. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Well, thank you for joining me here. Uh, talk about near real time streaming analysis. Do we have a microphone close by? Okay. All right. Maybe a challenge with the coding. But anyway, so I have a question. How many of you at one point had to write a piece of code that um, if you inject a bug, actually you kill a person? Wow, okay. Uh, never had one hand. Okay, that's cool. Um, so think about like uh, self-driving cars, right? They're like IoT devices, probably in four wheels, right? Um, what's happened actually if they're not able to analyze all the data they receive in a, in a fast manner and correct manner, right? Well, I hope you drive a lot of test-driven design around this code, right? Because self-driving car had to make a decision literally in real time and um, in a life decision manner, right? Think about if you're like, um, thousand event coming here, yes, right? Well, you can make maybe a decision based upon the last 10,000 event, 100 event, five minutes, maybe aggregate all these events and processing. And, um, but, you know, if you miss something, right, maybe the car can miss a stop signal and something can happen. So, what is stream, right? Really, think about stream as a, as a sequence, but is continuously in time and space, which mean can be uh, infinitely generative. Think about like stock prices or, or indexes and stuff like that. So it can be infinite and they keep coming to you, right? You can now anymore have the luxury to um, analyze only the piece of data that you're looking for. You just analyze all the, all the um, streams that are coming. So there are some properties around the streams. They are time dependent, as I said, you know, that uh, can be infinite. Um, they are ephemeral, which means that they uh, are um, short living, so they are coming in and they're going out, and you have a very short period of time to analyze this event. And also are transient, right? So they are immutable. So you can process the stream and event that they're coming, but you can now uh, go back in the past, or folks not in the future, and uh, you cannot mutate the, uh, the stream and event. And that's bring us to a new concept that, um, you know, we're all familiar with, the, you know, buzzword big data, right? But now we are through a new thing called um, big data, big data in motion, right? Because now these data are continuously moving over time. And uh, the big difference between um, big data and, and data in motion, think about like a train station, right? If you had to catch a train, well, you can get the, you know, the, the ticket, prepare your luggage, go to the train station. You have the luxury, the time, to look for the wagon that match your ticket and catch the train and have a safe trip, right? And that's match what we used to program these days, have the luxury to make a call to the API or a database and ask for 10 records to analyze, okay? You analyze the 10 records, and when you're done, you can make another call and get another five, another 20, whatever, right? So this is pretty much what's happening today with, with uh, the data we use to deal with that. But think about now that we try to catch the train that is moving, right? It's 20, maybe 40 miles per hour. Well, you know, hopefully you have a very light luggage with you. But um, it does bring, you know, the, the term of data motion where we don't have any more the luxury to decide the amount of data we are processing. It's just coming like an unstoppable train. And uh, data motion is um, getting more and more trendy these days, right? So we start to see paper uh, that are publishing around this topic, but we see also there are um, communities start to build taxonomy to express the properties that these um, data streams uh, have, such as the three Vs, right? which are about this characteristic of the data in motion, which have, the, the, of course, the, the variety because data can change, right? Different kind of type, structure on structure. But also refer to the um, variety of speed because sometimes data can come in a higher frequency, higher throughput, 
and sometimes slow down, right? So you have to figure out a way how you build the system to cope with this kind of um, change of frequency or rate. Velocity, well, as you can imagine, just you know, the, the amount of data that uh, come, and um, it can be like 10,000 in events per minute, per second. In this case, uh, we're gonna see later how asynchronous programming become really the key to use efficient, efficiently the resources to analyze all this data coming in the high speed. And the volume is um, really deal with the problem that you have like a massive amount of data to deal with the, with the, uh, with the processing. And, um, and this has become actually challenging, we say later, with something called back pressure, because now how you be able to deal with those amount of data, especially large amount of data, without running, I don't know, auto memory exception, overflow buffering, right? Because again, you don't have the luxury to store all the stream in memory and process it, right? You have to store and process it only the, the, the piece of stream, but continuously. So we're gonna see how you overcome this limitation. Even further, actually now, it turned out that this is the five is, which include also value and, uh, and veracity. And um, value you can refer is actually from the business perspective, how you transform this data in value. But um, the veracity actually refer to messiness, to how the data can be, um, think about Twitter, right? Twitter, uh, the message Twitter is an event, but inside Twitter we have like hashtags, right? Or also sometimes we deal with typos, right? So this is, uh, this is the uh, refer to veracity. So, and uh, one big thing we are challenging today with the real processing solution is how we build this system that is capable to ingest and, um, and store these messages in real time, right? Uh, especially when it is, as I mentioned with the 3Vs, when it's high volume and high speed. And uh, think about uh, when you process um, a stream, it's really a composition of different kinds of step or stages, right? And every step and every stage of your pipeline do some sort of process in your stream until you receive, uh, you reach your ultimate goal. But um, it has to be, everything to be done fast and quickly. Think about how you do like a real time uh, update to a dashboard, right? So um, this, is like, uh, uh, this is like the main property around um, system to analyze you know, uh, stream processing in a, in, a, in a correct manner. We have the synchronous property, of course, the no blocking, and we're gonna talk about no blocking later, especially the elastic for handling back pressure. We see how we can handle back pressure. we we'll talk about back pressure coming shortly. But this is meaning uh, the main three property around stream processing. The last one, compositional, well, is a plus. It's nice to have a system that you're able to leverage, like a small uh, building block, where we saw in the, in the stage, in the pipeline, where each stage can be composed and move around without um, you know, too much change in the code base and so forth. So, reactive programming. I just put this quote here because I like uh, um, this quote by Gerard Berry, yeah. that uh, it really talk about how we have to build system that is able to self-adapt, right? Where a program is able to deal with the environment, not all the way around. Uh, well, this is the, there was like a paper published about the Racti stream, which is uh, um, kind of related to the Racti manifesto. Are you familiar with the Racti manifesto? A few of you? Well, the Racti manifesto just said the property that the system should have to be reactive. And uh, from there was extract and uh, start to um, analyze the property that the Racti streams processing should have, which is a synchronous, a synchronous and a no blocking for black pressure. All right, so let's step back to the reactive system, right? What are these properties? Well, we start to talk about reactive manifesto and, uh, and the reactive system I should have the property about event-driven, which is message passing to the couple, the component of your system. Um, scalable, okay, you'll be able to scale the system up um, vertically, horizontally. Uh, responsive, you'll be able to cope with the increase of the load of the request without problem in a responsive manner. And of course, resilient, be able, uh, system be able to bring itself in shape if there is a problem, an exception, and so forth. And one way to implement you know, a reactive system, and one of my favorites, is the actor model, right? 
We have to model this small unit computation, independent, single-threaded, um, that communicate each other just through messages, right? Anybody familiar with the actor model? Okay, for you, that's cool. Um, and what is nice here that out of the box, you can leverage all the property to build the reactive system, right? Really, the actor model is compliant, compliance to the reactive system. Um, and um, the message that it used to pass between um, the actor from the caller or user perspective is asynchronous, no blocking, right? So, and the actor can be composed of a unit computation, can be grouped together as a system, and still communicate each other through messages, which is quite nice. So, why we talk about the actor model? Well, because let's see how from the actor model we can move toward like a stream processing. Because the actor model has already built in a series of properties that we can leverage, right? It's fault tolerance, as we saw earlier, is important for a uh, reactive system, high throughput, high availability, asynchronous, all this kind of good is out of the box that we can leverage. So maybe the actor model can fit um, our needs here to build uh, a stream processing, and we can use the actor as part of the, our pipeline, where you can see the green arrow there, where each step or each stage can be an actor and communicate each other through the message pass, um, through the message passing line, or the, the, the streamline here, um, passing the messages of the stream and processes, right? This is great, but you know, there is a little problem for those of you that are familiar with the actor model already probably figure out how, um, can you compose the actor? How this actor can actually be able to collaborate in a stream processing, right? Think about um, a topology level. We have actors that communicate each other, right? But really when you send a message to an actor, how you compose this pipeline, right? There is not really compositionality built in, right? Um, especially if you're familiar, you send a message, you tell a message, that method, that function, doesn't return anything, right? So if you come from the functional uh, programming uh, paradigm, you know that to compose two functions, the, the input or the second function had to match the output or the previous one. When here we have no output, how are we going to match this function? Well, you know, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's tricky. Now, the compositionality aspect is part of the message, right? You send a message, and when the message is completed, part of the payload of the message, you can tell where is the continuation of the message, where is the next stage, right, the next destination. So it's not really easy to do, right? It starts to be more complex, more code to write. Uh, this is F-sharp. I'm going to use both I'll be, I'll C-sharp and F-sharp. Any familiar with uh, C-sharp? Uh, that's what I said. F-sharp, beside this guy here, and all right, all right. Go F sharp. Um, but this is, is not really about programming languages, about you know, concept and, and, uh, and framework and tooling, more important than languages. In this case here, we have just an actor, receive a message here, and then do some processing here with the F function, and then send the result to the sender, okay? So pretty straightforward. So how are you gonna compose that? Because you wanna send a message, they continue to the, pi to the pipeline. You don't wanna send a message to the sender, you go backward, right? Well, one solution, most likely you pass in a constructor of the actor, the next step of the pipeline, right? You send a message, you process it, and then you send a message to the next step. Another alternative that you put here in the code, actually, a part of the payload, the message here, could be the reference of the next actor, right? Well, this is great, but think about like a simple, um, actor-based web crawler, right? Anybody familiar with this uh, web crawler? So let's say you have like uh, uh, this unit and this unit is gonna be represented by an actor, right? We have our download uh, HTML page. They download the, mess the, the, the page and then broadcast the message between an actor that do image parsing, just figure out how to extract the image from the HTML, and uh, a link parser here that extract the link from the HTML, right? Then other actor that just do some sort of side effect with the image can be persisted, um, do some work, massage it, whenever. And then we have the other 
actor here, the link here, that extract the link. So it send, can um, self-send it back to the previous actor. So it keep looping and go through all the, the links they found in the page to extract all the, um, the links, right? The broadcast here, um, actor actually, they're not straightforward as you can imagine. They have um, a series of actor building in the system. I mean, they have knowledge about a series of actor where they broadcast the messages, right? In this case, the second broadcast actor here had to knowledge about the first, the first one here and the image one, right? So there is some sort of uh, dependency required, right? All right, let's see some code about this piece of code. Okay, this is sure. Let's go down. Let's check first the F sharp one. I think you wrecked this stream here. And uh, both implementation, both in C sharp and F sharp. By the way, the code, and um, not the slide yet because I was tweaking it, but I'm going to be on GitHub and the hand the link. You can download the code and play with the, with the code sample. So the web crawler in, in F sharp, how are you going to build this web crawler? Uh, if I found a piece of code. Oh, it was in top of first solution. All right, so, and I comment here, agent composition is difficult. Let's see what I mean. So we have the fetch content agent, which is our download um, uh, agent, okay? Download the HTML from the, the page that I sent here. So the first solution, because I need to compose the pipeline, is passing the agent part of the construct here, okay? By the way, anyone can see the font in the back? Should I make it a bit bigger? Good. So now what's happened he here is that I receive the message asynchronously, process it, analyze the, the, the link, and send the link to uh, the agent that is passing the construct here, okay? Okay, this is the first actor. The second one, the broadcast, which you use later, in a construct actually I have a collection. You see the sign here is uh, an array. So what's happened here, when I send a message, the message is broadcast, in this case, with a for loop to all the agent that I register, okay? Then we have the image parser and the link parser. Pretty much they do the same thing, just that the different, uh, they extract a different um, HTML tag from the context. In this case, the link here extract all the um, link here to process and send it to all the actor that they register here. Okay? The same thing happened for the image one, just different tag. Okay, now I, all my component, the broadcast, the three actor that I was looking for, how are you going to compose this? Well, I commented out because this actually really doesn't really compose. Let's see if I Okay, because there is some sort of reference issue, right? We have to create an instance of an actor, and then reference the actor that is not created yet. So you start to build it up in the opposite order, like up inside out, but you still reach the point that you can now um, reference, right? So there is a problem here. So a solution is that part of the um, actor body here, we add a new message type, we actually, you know, we can send a message to the actor and said, well, I send this actor and add it to your current state so you have a knowledge about the actor that want to register. So sort of subscriber, okay? So in this case, I have this extra message here and the loop here, uh, this line here. You see there is a list of agent. They start empty and every time they send a message here to register an agent, you're gonna build up. So one point, when you extract the link and you send the messages, they have like a bunch of messages registered. Uh, sorry, yeah, a bunch of agents registered here. And the same thing, same approach can be used to other agents, right? So you still use another type of messages, the mailbox. So now the agent receives two types of messages, right? The data they have to process or the agent to register. They're going to be sent the message, the continuation of the, uh, of the process. Now, the code is the same, but now I can register, right? So before start, I send all the messages around to be able to create the topology that represent my web crawler with the agents, okay? And now it works. 
Same thing um, similar in C sharp. I use the, any familiar with the TPL data flow in C sharp? I know you do. Okay. So the, in short, the TPL data flow is a Microsoft library. It's part of the uh, system trading task namespace, but you have to uh, download the Nugget package. It's nice, .NET Core friendly. Uh, and what it does really, as the name implies, TPL data flow was designed really to build this uh, uh, pipeline and to step to compose them and create, you know, your sort of like data flow of um, um, event processing. In this case, it's very similar to what I just showed you in, in F sharp. There is a gacha though. In this case, I have an action block here. What it does, just receive an input and do something, a side effect. There is no output. Um, down here, we have the transformer block, which you can imagine take an input type A and return a, an output type B. In this case, both string, it really doesn't matter. What it does in this case, just extract a link and send it to the next step of the pipelining and so forth. So I build all this building block, right? And then ultimately, I just compose them with the um, link to um, operator, right? That's pretty straightforward. So my point is that it's not impossible to compose actor, but it's, you know, require a lot of code. It's not very decorative, right? And um, in this case, the downside of the TPL data flow doesn't contain a state. Like, for instance, if you do a processing, aggregating, let's say, 10 event, the last 10 event to do something, there's not really a state. It's just very transient, the events. So they're coming in, and when they're out, they disappear, right? So you have to build some sort of infrastructure to keep in memory the, 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 some sort of state. Instead, with the F sharp agent building, you can easily have some sort of state. But you know, it's not uh, um, that complex. That requires some effort to build. I'm not gonna run this code here, just trust me, work, download the code and, pr and try it yourself. Um, I wanna move forward. And uh, so we, we saw the code, so it's not impossible, but it'll be complex. It would be nice to be able to represent the same uh, idea, the same pipeline in, in a more decorative manner, you know, like link expression, right? We have some employee database, we do all the nice thing we wanna do, uh, get the, the events coming in, filter it, send it, and, um, and so forth. Anyone think they will link, right? Everybody love link? Only a few of you love link? Who doesn't know love link? So this is um, uh, the web crawler using ACA streams, and we're gonna talk about ACA streams shortly. Just remove the let, use var, and add a couple of curly brackets, you have C sharp. It just fits in my slides better. But anyways, so the idea you have to create your block, your the flow block, that you compose them, and do you know the resolve link here? And um, I nice to have a, like a laser pointer. Resolve link there, and uh, aggregate the result in some sort of collection. But when you're done, you have this building block, right? And you just compose them like in a fluent API from the source, broadcast the message to this flow, then merge it back, and so forth. And then the second part of the pipeline. And we're gonna express, we're gonna explain shortly how this is work, but pretty straightforward. So that's it, right? Very decorative. Now, let's stop. But, oh, that's nice. Well, I just want to show you this. Uh, let's see this one. Okay. So this is the result link when you extract the link, right? So this is the block when you receive a new write, download the page. Uh, this is going to be discussed shortly. Resolve the link. So this is block pretty much what it does. Asynchronously download the page and resolve the link. And here, do the rest to aggregate all the results, right? So, one thing that is the big challenge for real-time processing is uh, be able to build a system that is able to ingest um, and process all the message in real time, especially, you know, high volume. Anybody familiar with the back pressure or with this, what is black back pressure? Okay. So, the idea of back pressure is a problem then we have like a producer and consumer where the consumer is not able to cope with the, with the producer. When producer that produce way faster than consumer is able to uh, process the events, okay? Any familiar with this problem? Any familiar with uh, reactive extension, Rx? 
Okay, so that extension, for instance, is a great tool to um, build, you know, stream processing, but it is not really back pressure built in. There are some sort of um, uh, operator that are like throttling and so forth, but the problem with that is destructive. You lose data, right? If you remember previously, you might run, you know, in a self-driving car that probably doesn't see the stop. So back pressure is the challenge uh, when we build, you know, stream application. And, um, and every time we have an application that try to mediate between the producer and the consumer, um, you are running this issue, right? So in this case, we have the, pro the producer that creates five operations per second, but the consumer is able only to cope only one per second, right? So what's happened is that over time, we have the buffer that starts to build up, right? Well, you cannot really go forever, right? You're going to start to have problems such as uh, buffer overflow. Okay, so in this case here, you know, you can, um, of course, increment the buffer, but you still, at one point, later in the future, you're going to run the same issue. It's just like temporary solution. Or, of course, you can use operator to drop the messages, right? So you're going to lose data, but at least your system won't crash, right? Because out-of-memory exception can be a very bad problem to solve. So, how are we going to find a solution for this, right? So that's actually what uh, uh, the active stream manifesto with the properties such as a synchronicity and um, back pressure handling um, explain, right? Or at least emphasize the characteristic, the property that your system should have. Any, any questions so far? Okay, so from the buffer overflow here, we can, um, the reactive stream design, and we see how this is implemented underneath it, as a idea to create um, like a bidirectional communication between producer and consumer, right? It's called uh, dynamic communication because it is capable to switch between pushing or pulling. So the producer keep pushing and send events to the consumer, but now, because this bidirectional communication, the consumer can actually tell to the producer to slow down, okay? So it's which, and tell slow down, give me only two events, three events, or stop until I gonna grab events myself, okay? So back to our presentation of the uh, stream processing based on staging here, where each stage is represented by an actor here. What's happened now, the actor, the actor communicate to each other also back and forward, okay? Until there's no reason, just the messages flow through the pipeline without, um, without problems. But if there is some sort of um, issue to the, um, from the consumer side to um, cope to the producer, to the event produced by the producer, it send message, a message back to slow down. Uh, one thing is that pretty nice, actually, how this is work also for multiple subscribers, okay? So in this case here, we can have uh, multiple actors, and what's happened is that each subscriber that can be have like a different rate and a different kind of um, um, independent um, way to manage the back pressure, which is quite nice. So this is a, an interface that actually the reactor stream paper that uh, it was like a, uh, a bunch of uh, big dogs such as Red Hat, Twitter, um, I forgot about, mainly, you know, they, they decide to come out with this paper to describe how to build a Reactis, um, Reactis stream system. And this is pretty much the base interface. If you're familiar with the Reactis extension that I asked earlier, this is around, look very familiar, right? You push events to the next step of the pipeline. But what's happened here, we have this interface, this description, which is passed to the constructor, also to the publisher here, because it's here. And this is like the channel that you use by the consumer to communicate back to the producer to tell to slow down. Because at this point here, the request 
is going to send, well, give me only 10 data, give me only three data, or just keep going until I'm going to tell you to slow down, okay? So this is pretty much the interface that um, is the base between, uh, b the base of the Reactive stream Streams um, processing framework, such as AkaStream, both JVM and Aka.net, and, and, uh, and others such as uh, Noca for Spark, and, uh, well, I forgot now, but pretty much all apply to this interface, okay? So Arca Streams is the one they use here as a main tooling, but again, it's not about the, really the tooling, about the concept. What I, about, about, what I like about Arca Streams, really the abstraction that they build on top of all the actors, right? Um, because whenever you create your topology, um, it really creates all the infrastructure underneath the transparent thing for you. You don't need to know what's happened, but really build all the actor that communicate each other to create um, a synchronous uh, um, stream processing. I'm gonna skip this because there is a C sharp too, huh? Better? So think about now we have the source here, more data, just one to 1,000, create, it just use a multiplication and do the output, pretty straightforward. It's very much familiar with the link, right? Uh, the difference here is the materialization aspect, where actually this is won't produce anything until you materialize the um, ACA stream here. And think about like in a in link expression, the two list or two array, right? Or a list evaluated, nothing happened until you materialize the, the, the enumerable. And here is the same here, yet to materialize, to materialize the, uh, the graph. So, Really, like a stream is building top of the idea of flow, right? Of building blocks that you can compose and together. So what are these, uh, um, these elements, right? Well, think about really like boxes, right? They have the source here, they just have one output, okay? So the source produces the event, but beside produce is also the point of integration, such as you have your integration, such as maybe your Kafka, um, you know, or your Twitter handle or whenever, they produce an event integrated to the source, which is gonna start the pipeline for your stream processing. You have the flow, which as you can imagine, you have one input and one output, and all the projection transformation happen inside this flow. Um, in the pipeline here, there are multiple flow attached, okay? It's not just one. It can be really combined with many others. And the last block here is the sync, which is the side effect to produce something, right? Um, right to the database, or to the console, and so forth. And all this piece here, I put the star here because I mentioned there are many flow, is uh, your entire topology, your runnable graph. And the graph really represents like your blueprint, is immutable. So you create your graph, and you can compose different graphs together, okay? Because we have a graph to process like a Twitter sentiment analysis, and uh, another graph that process uh, the location, the tweet to analyze the weather, and making a correlation if people are more happy with the sunny weather or not, right? So that's back to the uh, previous slide. So how does this work? So we have the input here, which is gonna be our source. The F1, F4, F2 are the flow, okay? So we saw the flow have one input and one output, okay? However, the broadcast element here are what able to dispatch in channel, you know, one to many, um, your, your, your flow, your, your stream processing, okay? So in this case here, we have this pipeline that receives an input here, makes some projection, and then dispatch the message in two different channels, which then the result is merged together to run the final function here, and then have the output, okay? This is pretty much represented easily with our graph here, we have our source, which is our input, and then we create these two elements, the broadcast and the merge, the broadcast and merge here. You see, I create two channels, because that's gonna be the two channels that I broadcast, one or two, and the merge also have two channel input, input one, input two. We have our function f1 to f4, doesn't know anything sexy, but you know, bear with me for the example. But here, this is how this is work. You have the source, that 
uh, start with the function one and then broadcast here. When they broadcast here, we have the function f2, then the merge, and run the result to f3. But they broadcast dispatch, and now when this is dispatched at the channel from this, uh, um, this channel here via for, uh, function two, now this channel also starts running. So the broadcast is pass, uh, the broadcast channel pass the result to function f2, f4, and they're merging together. So now when you reach this point, the result is merged here, okay? So you build all your channel. Because again, this is all lazy evaluated. When you materialize that this is run. So that's where um, all you create all your topology, and when you're done, you materialize it, you create all this fancy, maybe very complex system of actors that communicate each other. How many minutes? 15? All right, 18. Okay, let's run a quick example here. And uh, so there are a bunch of uh, stream processing here in, uh, in C Sharp as well. I use, uh, um, in this case, I have a Twitter sentiment analysis to figure out if you're happy or no, based on your tweet. I use the, I have a, like a, Bunch of Twitter save locally, just to be sure I'm not relied on internet, you never know. Um, but you can switch uh, the use cache tweets here with false, and you can run also with the real um, live tweets, okay? So there are different kind of graphs here. I'm gonna run just um, one because I wanna cover the next topic. So I'm just gonna put this mic down one second. Okay, so here I have my, um, my graph, right? So there are different kind of component flow on my graph. I get my tweet uh, in input here, okay? Um, the source actually have uh, this data flow producer here, which um, it just read from the local file system, a bunch of tweets, massage it, and make it in an interface base so I can, I can know where, what to read and where. So pretty straightforward. I have my block here that read from Twitter my, the user. I extract the coordinate of my Twitter here. I calculate the temperature here. And I have an API that they call outside a service for this. We're going to see this in a second. And here I put everything together. Like in the slide, I have my, um, my broadcast and merge operator here. I have my first small graph here, where pretty much compose my flows. Here we're gonna see something interesting though. We have a throttle. So throttle in this case actually, because I have a two channel, is able to um, create an equilibrium between the two channel to be able to both cope at the same speed, okay? Um, in this case, this is the interesting part, I have the get weather async, which is an API that actually I do an IO call. Okay, which is gonna be slower than the first um, graph here because this is just you know straight uh, call to the um, in-memory processing. Okay, so in this case, let's run this piece of code here. Or oh, the, the the running here, you just grab my graph here and then materialize it here. So pretty straightforward. Here the source. It where it comes from, from the file system enumerator that start to loop through. Which is pretty cool actually, I think I have like 100 megabytes of tweets. When you zip is like only eight. I'm gonna put that also on GitHub so you don't have to waste a bunch of time. So here we're gonna have the our treats. Okay, so now we have our treats coming in, it tells the use the user, the location and the temperature of the location based on the coordinate of the tweet, okay? This is okay, but the problem that we're seeing here is that um, the I.O. operation, let's see, what is it? The I.O. operation here, it can be, you know, uh, the, the factor that determines the speed of the overall graph, right? So in this case, I have the select async, and hopefully I have time to cover that, but what it does, you can imagine, 
decouple the computation in the synchronous boundaries. So in this case, I put only one, but if I, you know, I increment the value, for instance, to five, what's happened now that this specific graph is able to produce more um, result and able to make more requests to determine the temperature of the location of the tweet, right? So now, if you remember the speed previously here, I run it, and it's way faster, right? Because now I'm able to make five asynchronous call in parallel versus just one. And that would just like really change one digit uh, of, of your code. Pretty straightforward. And only for structure build to create the asynchronous boundaries is handled by you know, the, the framework. But let's make it run here. So I want to cover here and tell me when I have like five minutes left that um, I'll be sure to cover that. All right, so very important asynchronous boundaries for stream processing. The idea that uh, um, generate uh, the couple step of your pipeline in independent unit of computation, right? In this case, the red bubble here is separate the, 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 the stage of the pipeline in asynchronous boundaries. Because per default, there's something called um, operator fusion. What it does, is that by default, the step of the processing are combined together. And this is actually a very good uh, design as default because um, using the synchronous per default, it'll introduce a lot of extra overhead, the, the reducing the performance, right? So in this case, if you remember the steps we saw earlier from Twitter, get the user, get the coordinated, and so forth, they're all combined in one actor, okay? which mean that the, the processing is way faster because all the extra overhead is reduced to zero. Think about like um, a link, you have like a where and select, you pretty much have the where and select run together the same operator, right? You have all in one uh, fuge computation. So let's see what's happened here. I have a simple um, spin that just, you know, just CPU eating computation, nothing. But here I run it for 3,000 times, and I run it, and I run the map against this operator because it returned the value, okay? So you run, you run, you run 3,000 times, and return 3,000. And this is go for it, right? And then I materialize it. So in this case, these two operators here are gonna be fused together to reduce the extra overhead. But specifically, in this case here, which really is um, a high CPU uh, consumption, function here, we could create some sort of asynchronous boundaries between this stage to be able to be independent, right? At this point here, they won't be, they won't be fused, and each stage is gonna be run independently. What is nice here that is ultimately in care for you, the, the asynchronous part passing the message when it's completed to the next step, okay? Now, that, that was nice. We saw actually um, how we just with apply the async operator here, we're able to create async boundaries between um, our flow in our pipeline. And there is another operator here that I show you earlier when uh, we make many different kind of call to the um, web service of the weather, I think weather temperature. It's called async map. And uh, what it does here actually, a step forward, is um, you run this uh, computation when the expression here actually it return a task or a synchronous computation expression, either way, right? In this way, it really is able to run the task in a different execution thread, and when the result is completed, continue to the workflow, which again, this is a lot of code if you write yourself, right? Because that's gonna be spawned a different thread, wait the computation without blocking the result to pass to the next step. The gotcha here, though, is that, oh well, uh, I use one, but of course, you know, you can increment it. Like in an eight core machine, uh, running your know, four thread per block here, probably gonna be like, you know, uh, four times faster, yeah. The gotcha here is that there is a, a difference between the flow async, the create the async boundaries, and the uh, map async, right? Which mean that still, 
when you do the operation using async map, this is going to be fused together, okay? So to achieve truly parallelism, you still have to decouple the component in different boundaries. So ideally, the real truly parallel um, computation is going to leverage both the async map, but also uh, the couple from the other stage of the computation in the async boundaries, okay? Um, last gotcha, and I'm gonna show you a, a little demo. And I think that um, when you run a lot of uh, string processing, well, sometimes you wanna group the event you receive in, like in batches, right? Think about that you string processing some sort of an event and you keep persist in the end database, right? Well, instead to handle one event at a time, most likely you want to group by 100 or 50 or whenever, and then in batch persist it to the database and so forth. Uh, there is also, in case a group creates some sort of latency, you can use the group within, they introduce also uh, a time factor. So in this case, uh, is either 100 messages or after you know, 15 seconds. It's going to go down here. And I have an example I want to show you. So I have um, a piece of code here. Actually, let's run it first because it takes a second to run. Kill everything. Let's run. Build. OK, let's run in one second. So the code is in two parts. It's a client, which is a UI which I use WebSocket to update the UI to real time. And what it does actually, um, is sort of the Twitter analysis, it get the tweet and then publish the location of the sender and also do some um, sentiment analysis using ML.net. Any familiar with ML.net? It's a new Microsoft uh, machine learning library that is not, not on the core friendly, actually it's quite nice um, to use. And, uh, I'm gonna start with the start async here, okay? You see what's happened. So now we start to see to populate the map and the green one are happy, the blue are indifferent, and the red are not happy, okay? You see the populate all these, uh, oh, there are a few are not happy. And here you can see also in, this, in the code here, the, the console, yeah, the green um, in, uh, happy, the blue are indifferent and so forth. So we have two different channel right now the WebSocket channel at the console uh, channel. So how this is built? So I'm gonna skip the UI, but the server where all the meet happen here. I have a WebSocket infrastructure here, uh, let's see. Okay. I have a stream function here that um, I use to determine the graph to use, can be asynchronous or synchronous or in parallel, okay? So really, pretty much what we saw earlier with the C-sharp code, they just grab all the tweet by numerator and send it to the graph to be uh, rendered. Okay. Where is my mouse? Okay. Up here, uh, let's go to the cool part, the parallel one, okay? They go right in a second. This piece of code just used, as I mentioned, the um, sentiment analysis using the ML.net uh, Microsoft library for machine learning. I just load a model. I, the, the source code is uh, in uh, this project here. And uh, I do some sort of, of computation here, build the model for you, and then I uh, create a pipeline here for figure out the sentiment of the message here, it creates a score, and then um, what I do here, I use the safe model, so it persists like a zip file for you, so you don't have to create the model every time, or you can. And then the load function here, it just load up the model that you just generated, so uh, you can use it to calculate the score of the tweet to figure out the sentiment. So the cool part here is that for each step, and probably a little bit overkilling, but good for demo purpose, I separate um, the block using the flow async here. In C sharp, it's just dot async, right? In F sharp, we like, you know, the fancy pipe operator, but apply the same. 
and the dot async here create the boundary for you. So now this block here is going to run in a dependent actor, right? Which, as we see here in the parallel version, async map an order. You can imagine doesn't keep the order, but in this case here, you can scale up the um, the actor, right? Just simply passing a level of degree of parallelism mode, and just for you able to distribute the work among other actors here. And of course, as I recommended, you separate everything in a different ASIC boundaries here. So the temperature here, uh, little thing here, also this one I ran asynchronously. This is actually the same piece of code we saw in C sharp that you know grab some value to figure out the temperature or the origin of the tweet here. And here I have two sync, right? One to write in a console with a print color function here, change the color base upon the sentiment. And update here, it just update the uh, using WebSocket, the UI. And you can check the code home, how the WebSocket works, pretty straightforward. And here I just create my graph, right? I have my one channel here with the broadcast here. In this case, I have two channels for the broadcast that I dispatch between two different outputs, can be console and socket, okay? Now, let's go back here, actually. There's a lot of Twitter right here, but you see it's still coming, popping here and there. Uh, okay. Any question? Let's reset it, okay, okay. Let's run. Okay, let's run it and see when. And now we're gonna run this in parallel, see how the performance really increase. Uh, we just, you know, very little code base changes. Just the trick is create your asynchronous boundaries and then we're independent, you're able to um, scale the work in parallel easily, okay? This is especially useful for IO operations such as web servers call and so forth. Run in parallel here and you can see there is you know, quite an increase in performance. All right, I know I'm almost out, out of time here. Give me the bad look. Okay. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna go to the conclusion here. Um, okay, so great benefit from and stream processing, especially everything is data, everything can be streamed. It doesn't mean to be you know, live, it can be also database, it really reduce the resource consumption. It can be easily parallelized. And um, you can really implement truly true parallelism mode with the synchronous boundaries. And also, in the slide, I skipped a few gotcha, but they're also like throttling and uh, buffering and so forth to really maximize the performance of your system. I'm here around for your question. That's all I got. And here, the tweet and everything. And I'm gonna post or I give here the, the link for the slides, but they're gonna be all in my GitHub here. Like, so, any question? <laughs> it can be, right? It can be, you translate it for me, right? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we'll do that. Вопрос uh, можно задавать на русском, мы переведем. Если есть вопросы из онлайна, пишите мне в личку, и я их озвучу. Okay, I'll be the first one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, my question, can we just replace some uh, actions just to repeat uh, some actions from previous actor or just from the root? And the second question, uh, just, yeah, let me. Uh, can we um, skip uh, our subscriptions uh, to apply some kind of filter for the first actor? Just do not uh, to add some condition inside of act and just to skip it from scratch. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, sure, so first question, can you um, reroute the message from the previous actor, not just the root, right? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, just replay. Right, okay, so from yes. From root or yeah, previous. Um, like uh, in the web cloud, I have as an example, he reroute to the main uh, actor here, but you can dispatch to different actors. So yes, yeah, no problem. It can be also like in self, in self broadcast to different actors. So you can do that easily. The filtering is uh, not the box, but actually interesting you asked that. So the question was, if I'm correct, uh, apply some filtering um, per stage, is that correct? To figure yeah. out which event process which not, like some sort of Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, so yes, it's now the box, but um, uh, actually quite easily to inject that as a functionality. So yeah, is 
you just create a flow that actually is a predicate. So, um, and then dispatch. And that depend, if you want the events that are no compliance to your predicate, just you know, ignore it or reroute to a different actor whenever. But yeah, you can easily uh -huh. implement that. Thank you. Sure. Um, next question here. Thanks for uh, near real time presentation and uh, little question. I forgot uh, what the library you used uh, uh, next, uh, last. A library from Microsoft that you used in uh, next uh, for the machine learning one. Yes, 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 yes. Is a ML.net. Is a ah, ML is machine thanks. learning .net. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's .net friendly. There was a, oh, oh my god, I forgot. The previous one was uh, not not TensorFlow. CNTK, right? There was also one which is still you know supported, but I think I see more and more investing in ML.NET rather than CNTK. And it's a very nice library. Uh, you can do a lot of machine learning algorithm. So it's all built in. It's pretty nice. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, one question about back pressure. So you talked a lot about back pressure problem and then switched to the uh, streams library. So uh, what are basically the tools that uh, streams library uses to solve this backstream uh, issue, uh, so back pressure issue. So the question is what uh, the library use or what yeah, library? Yes, what, what do we have in this uh, uh, streams, uh, ACA streams library mm -hmm. to prevent the back pressure problem? Right. Yes, it's uh, built in. And uh, I showed earlier like the interface when um, the interface that they really define uh, the methodology to avoid black pressure is really um, nothing that uh, ACA stream or anything else invented. It was uh, this guy here. This is like an agreement different, uh, like Red Hat, Twitter, uh, I think Amazon, other company. They really decide the criteria building um, to to build system that handle back pressure, right? So, like ACA streams implement this interface. And the trick is that you use the app subscription interface that is passed to the publisher. So you think about two actors that communicate each other, the publisher, in this case, and knowledge of the other actor, and both are able to communicate like back and forward with a request method there, is able to uh, handle, you know, keep going or only um, send me only a few messages and so forth. So yeah, ACA stream support, you know, um, back pressure, but every toolkit that it complies to the React stream manifesto uh, should implement this interface to be you know, uh, able to handle back pressure. And there are other toolkits out there because of ACA stream. ACA stream I picked it because I did a lot of work in the past with ACA.net, and for me it was just an easy fit, but there are other toolkits out there that can be used. Next question here. Right, thank you for the presentation and also small question. So when you use some Twitter API, you probably met some limitations. For example, you just can make like 100 call per minute or something right. like that. How can you handle it? Well, or you pay some money, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> or like for the demo here, I just make a run overnight to get like over 100 megabytes of tweets or text, which is a lot of tweets. But yeah, you can access the API. There is something that Microsoft also, part of the Azure function, um, uh, out the box, I forgot the name, but you can handle that base. Yeah, you have to pay some money though, to have like. Okay, you know, thank so, you. Yeah. It's all about money. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, the question is about monitoring. Uh, does uh, ACA Streams provides any built-in mechanism for monitoring? What are the possible backends? For what, sorry? For, uh, for monitoring, I mean. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So what are the possible backends, uh, built-in mechanism, and uh, possibility to add like some custom metrics yes. to monitor? So there is actually built-in. Uh, is, um, there is uh, some actor called actually monitor actor, something like that. But yeah, you can monitor the, the actor. And uh, so there is a, a library that provide, um, there is open source community supported, but ACA.net use it for the monitoring. Mm -hmm. But you can easily plug uh, any sort of dashboard for real time, you know, updates like uh, uh, Grafana, one that we use, uh, all the, 
another job, and um, I forgot the, the name of the other one. But yeah, so yeah, easily you can put it there. But they, they provide already built-in graph that is able to grasp all the event around the, the framework that's happening, and you can use to uh, make real-time updates. Yeah, actually pretty straightforward, very easy. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Um, I got one. Yep. Uh, so, as far as now, there was the promise of the uh, Acker stuff that um, you can do the like uh, you can do the system uh, with their kind of a, not thinking about whether the actors are remote or they are in the same process, right? Right. So. Uh, I, I never used ACTA myself in production, and pr you probably did. Mm -hmm. So does it still stand? D does it really work that way that you can implement the system not really thinking of whether the actor is on the same process yes. or in a remote machine? Yeah. And uh, w whether if you're using the streams, does it still hold or it changes yeah. for you from the like maintainer perspective? Right, so th the question is correct. I use uh, ACTA.net providing you know, all this infrastructure for remote communication across processing and this apply to the streams as well, right? So, um, so yeah, it, out of the box provided, you know, it's called, um, um, how is it called? Location transparency. Location transparency, where actually you send a message and the framework is able to understand where actually you mean to send the message, it can be in the process, out of the process, different machine, the network, right? It's all handled, uh, by the framework uh, for you, and I use something smart called the actor ref, which is now a reference as a pointer, but either can be a pointer is in process or a, an address if it's remote out of the process, right? Uh, so you can communication uh, a different kind of system and allow you to uh, scale horizontally because now you can have multiple machines connected and run in parallel and so forth. Uh, ACA streams is that close to be able to be distributed using the same framework. It's not there yet, but it's gonna be very soon. Um, as today, you still have used both, so you still have the communication across process, across machine, ACA.net, and other side, um, ACA stream ingests the messages and process it. Um, so it's not there yet, but it's coming soon. But the implementation using the actor model as interim between the communication process, between processes is pretty simple, though. But yeah, so almost there. Um, we have time for one, one more last question. Yep. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, you mentioned that uh, you, uh, this is uh, real, almost real uh, streaming uh, data, but uh, also you said that it, it should uh, recover state when the exception uh, falls down, and, but in this code we didn't see something. And yeah. it, in fact, you didn't uh, explain how do you recover uh, state, do you have uh, something here? So, well, so that would be like a huge topic to cover. However, uh, in short, if I, as the correctly, you talk about it, the fault tolerancy aspect, right? If something crash, I'll be able to recover, right? So, um, think about really, forget about ACA stream, because ACA stream is really built on top of the um, actor model, right? Which out of the box provide something called supervision, which is um, an hierarchy dependency between some actor children and the parents that create this actor, right? There is a problem with one actor, some exception. Well, the exception bubble up to the parents, which has a, has a built-in default strategy, or you can inject your own strategy based upon the exception type or any sort of criteria that you want to apply. And the uh, parents are going to apply the strategy to bring in shape the actor, as it was in the beginning. Uh, it can be also recover the state so you don't lose messages. It's tricky because sometimes maybe the messages will create the exception, so you have to build something to be careful what you're doing. But they give you a lot of flexibility around it. And, um, and the exception bubble up all the way up until the root, which is the top parent, right? So in somehow the system won't crash. In fact, there is this term with actor model, let it crash, not try catch block anything. Uh, the ACA streams is just building top of that. So by default, they have supervision. Something goes wrong, it's just gonna bring back the, the system in shape without worry. Uh, but I didn't see, I didn't show the code, um, but uh, there is some uh, very simple configuration option to pass 
actually to pass your supervision strategy so for so actually it's very simple to to implement it really built in so really like abstraction on top of the actor model which the supervision built in which is yeah, good question thanks thank you. um all right so we are out of time for the question thank you very much ricardo this is most junior for you this is uh, our branded t-shirt yeah it's out of movember um, and uh, we have uh, two souvenirs for the audience, so you have to pick two questions, uh, two best questions that uh, deserve the prize. We have two prizes. We have the, the, just the same T-shirt, uh, but this will be the second prize. And uh, the first one will be a prize from our partner, Platica. Uh, give a round of applause to them, and uh, they, they are presented in a power bank, so you, you never run out of power. <laughs> All right. Well, actually. Hold on one second. Well, let's see if I found. Shh. I hopefully didn't delete my slide. All right. Uh, I give away one of my book here. So third, uh, I, it's digital. So give me your email. I send you the code. You can download it for free from Manning Publisher. So it's a great book. Strongly recommend it. <laughs> hey. All right. Um, uh, three questions. Oh, if I remember that. <laughs> uh, maybe raise your hands those who ask questions. That'll bring up some memories. Yes. Well, it's only three. Done. All of us come back home with a prize. Okay, so you have to pick who gets what. All right. Um, we have the, we have the T-shirt. Yeah, the we had just the same T-shirt, but without the speaker name. Oh. <laughs> T-shirt. Or. All right. Okay, first choice. Okay. Okay. Um, supervision. I like the last question. So my book. And uh, hey, you get the T-shirt, man. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hey, don't move. I make a picture. Uh, take a picture. May I? Yeah. Let's do that. Thank you very much, Ricardo.